um, that you're listening to Sandra, because if I am, or if you're listening over the radio, we don't know who's on. And so sometimes during the midst of the talk, it's nice to hear the names. I listened to for a while today about somebody talking about meditation and had absolutely no clue of who it was. And of course, you know, from the voice, I was thinking, oh, that sounds like this person. Oh, that sounds like that person. And realized that I probably didn't have a clue of who I was listening to. But it was all good because it's the ideas that drive us. And so um, I was able to listen from that regard. So here I am, and uh, <laughs> now, listen, it's only one of us here, right? So if it's only one of us here, then I guess it was me that was talking about meditation and not necessarily some guy from um, Nebraska, right? <laughs> yeah, but I, I, it was uh, actually a good talk, and then I was at the hospital, and then my brothers walked in. I have no clue who it was. Um, but, uh, was it you? Was it you that was talking about meditation? I don't know. I have no clue. But, um, but like I said, uh, they didn't say their name. I didn't hear any names. And so I just listened in while I was able to listen in and kept it moving. So I just made note to self. I said note to self, Sandra. Say your name is Sandra from time to time while you're talking so that uh, in case somebody tunes in off the radio and can't see in the room who has the mic, we'll know who's talking. So I had an absolute, you know, for me, I, I always have a wonderful time. Girlfriend of mine's wanted to have a, uh, a conversation the other day. Uh, we were sitting on the phone probably on Saturday morning. I've got my phone in my pocket. I've got my head set on and I'm working around the house. And all of a sudden she wants to have this interesting, deep, I guess, conversation. Like a lot of times our conversations, you know how we are. We have these surface conversations where we talk about a little much of nothing. And then every once in a while, we take our mask off and we decide that we're going to have an in-depth conversation. And so on this particular day, she started asking questions that uh, for any of you who know me or that listen to me any to any extent, Sometimes I like to like um, reach deep down inside and try to figure out what's my deepest truth. I mean, and 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 say the truth that that just totally opens me up and um, and try to share from that perspective, not just talking about it like you know fluffing over it like we can do sometimes be kind of flippant. How are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. How are you? We've got these pat answers, these, these, um, these, you know, trivial things that we share with one another without really going into depth about any of this. It, it, and it's so interesting because in this community that we're in, in the course community, there are so many variations on the levels of sharing that people try to get into and that they find important. So sometimes you'll hear people that'll kind of fluff it off and say, ah, none of it's real anyway. And so they don't want to talk about their life, their experiences, the places where they might be experiencing something that's giving them some challenges because it's, you know, it's, it's, for nothing, they think. Um, and then there are those in this community that feel as if there are no private thoughts. And, um, and so if there's no private thoughts and we're not trying to please one another, simply showing up to be who we are, then it shouldn't matter anyway. So I am from the school that likes to, um, yeah, I, yeah, I, 
I, you know, and it's funny, Paul just uh, typed up, Dr. Tuttle, just typed up that I do not want to look less than perfect. And, you know, I, I sit there and I think to myself when you say that, and I say that often, um, I, I used to get caught up in this thing called perfectionism. And when I think about what perfect is, I always think about it in the sense um, from when I was doing philosophy, where they talked about perfect being as complete and as full as something can be in a moment. So it doesn't mean that it comes without perceived flaws. It means that since we live in the now moment, whatever is, is all that it can be in the moment because the next moment is a new moment. And so every moment becomes perfect when you look at it as if it is complete in and of itself. It is what it is. And so, um, so then, so what now what kind of thing, you know, it becomes this thing of, of, of everything just being these wonderfully complete packages, kind of like motion pictures used to be when you would see a motion picture, it was all these little frames. And in each of these frames, there were minute differences. But when you kind of speed them up and put them all together, it makes it look like the picture is in motion and constantly moving. And so it becomes all that it can be in any moment. So there, it is always perfect. It's not possible for it to be any other way. The other thing is, is that if, if we know that we are, if, if we know that we are one with God, if we know that we, ideas leave not their source, that we are as our creator created us, like our creator, if we know all those things, to think any less of, of ourselves than being perfect and how we are, just as we are, perfectly created to be how we are. The moment we think less than that, then we are, um, you know, we're saying, well, you know what, God, you kind of messed up. And so, um, and so the truth about it is, is that you are wonderful. You are perfect. And who cares what another person's eyesight says? Because, you know, agree with me, you know, agree with me. <laughs> um, and, and so, yeah, I don't even worry about uh, a perfect anymore. Sometimes perfect for me is just truth. Perfect is being truthful. And in my truthfulness, I think I'm being close to Godness because if God is truth and God is not judging what is, then that becomes truth. That becomes what it is in that instance. So, um, and so, yeah, that is, that is, that is what I think we do. So thank you, Larry. Private thoughts is simply ego thoughts is simply illusions. In other words, private thoughts are nothing. And so we might as well share all the stuff that we thought was private because if ideas are shared, right? If ideas are shared, then, you know, what is it? And here's the other thing. I think that sometimes when I put down my mask and say, you know what, you thinking less of me or you thinking something about me doesn't bother me. I think it is that, that I, you know, it's kind of like Marianne Williamson said, when I do that, it's almost as if I give per people permission to do that too. Because if you're judging me, um, when I say what I say, if you're judging me, um, then, you know, that's on you. I mean, you can, you you have every right to do that. But if you see that in your judgments, it doesn't diminish me in any kind of way, then what do you have to lose by being judged? I mean, it doesn't diminish you. And so all of us are just doing what we do. We're living the life that we live and being who we are. And that person, that is special in and of itself. Ah, I would rather be right than wrong. I mean, happy. So no, I got it backwards. I think, yeah, would you rather be right or happy? <laughs> Words are meaningless. Hmm. We give them all the meaning that they have, right? And so 
but 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 here's the other thing if words are meaningless then what's the point in typing them <laughs> i mean what's the word what's the point in talking or even communicating if we see it as meaningless i mean to some extent we must believe that that they have some type of meaning for us or else we wouldn't even bother we wouldn't even you know journey down that particular path I mean, what else is communication for? That's how we communicate in, in this day and time. So anyway, let me, let, me, let me get on with it here. So let me do this. This is A Course in Miracles, the introduction. This is A Course in Miracles. I'm sitting here also, you guys, looking at myself as I'm doing this on Ustream uh, because I like to broadcast over Ustream. And then the funny thing is, is it's always amazing to me that people will come up to me and say, hey. Sandra, I watched you the other day. So, um, so hi to anybody who is watching me on Ustream over my website or whatever thing, whatever uh, vehicle you use. So here's the introduction of the Course in Miracles. It says, this is a Course in Miracles. It is a required course. Only the time you take it is voluntary. Free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum. It means only that you can elect what you want to take at a given time. The aim of the course is not to teach the meaning of love, for that is beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, at removing the blocks to your awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. The opposite of love is fear, but what is all-encompassing can have no opposites. This course can therefore be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened, and nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. <laughs> So when I first read that, one of the things that I got stuck on was this thing about love not being able to be taught. It says to teach the meaning is the aim of the course is not to teach the meaning of love, for that is beyond what can be taught. And so it was always interesting to me because I had over the years, I used to, you know, I used to do regular radio and we would always get into these conversations about love and what love was and what it looked like and how it felt and all this stuff. We talked about it in very carnal ways, in ways that um, we talk about special relationships here. We talked about love in that respect. And we were always trying to find out for each other, you know, for ourselves, define it and say how it looks. And, and for every person, I don't care who it was, they experienced something very different. Depending upon what they saw in their homes, you would see people who came from homes where there was plenty of abuse, um, where, um, where there was a lot of things that were going on, whether it was physical abuse, mental abuse, um, you know, broken homes, whatever kinds of homes that they were, everybody came from, came to this question of love from a different perspective. What does love say do? And so, oh, wow, that's a loud motorcycle. So, so you would have all these people talking about and trying to have a conversation about something and yet think that it had all these parameters around it for it to exist or for it to be present. And so they were thinking that love was something that one person did with another, you know, based on whether or not um, that person was meeting their needs or that person was aligned with them in some type of way. We, we get these relationships, we set them up and we set them up as these torture chambers, I think for ourselves, like, you know, I'm going to love you if, if you, you know, if you do this the right way, or if you, you know, if you call me on time, or, you know, or if you show up, or if I can depend on you. You know, we've got all these stipulations to loving, and, and we talked about love in these kind of ways, like, you know, well, love, you know, it, love would have brought you home last night. Love would have made you call me. Love would have made you um, blah, 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 blah. You know, we always think about it in those terms. But when I started to read the course, I started to think about love in a totally different way. I was, I, you know, oh, who was it? Um, 
who was it that I read? Because, you know, I, I read uh, Eric Fromm. Eric Fromm is this wonderful philosopher who did this, um, this book about love. And I forget what it was called. Maybe it was called... Um, Oh, I can't even think of what it was called, but he did this wonderful, wonderful book on love. And one of the things that he that he talked about was is that in most relationships, we're not trying to love other people. We're trying to love ourselves in other people. The art of loving. Thank you so much, Teddy. <laughs> the art of loving. So he was saying that we were we were trying to find and love ourselves in other people. So he was like saying that. You know, to some extent, if you look like me, if you act like me, if you talk like me, then I, you know, people feel like then I can love you. And and so it becomes this thing where they really don't love themselves. But if I look at you through, if I look at me through your eyes, then I'll love me even more. And so it becomes this kind of sick kind of relationship. And then he said that, you know, rather than, I've read so many of his books, I'm, I, you know, I get which came out of which book. But he was talking about this thing of, you know, that that people go through and rather than than them feeling like love should give them wings and go forth. And and I know I'm paraphrasing. I add stuff into it that I get these enlightened moments that I get. But rather than seeing this as something that gives us wings and causes causes us to stand up that much better in the world. It, he said that what we do is, is we try to like uh, like you know, breathe through these, you know, these umbilical cords or, you know, try to try to make this thing give me all the nourishment, give me all that I need. And it causes you to kind of constrict and kind of be something other than what you were meant to be. And so as I came to the course and I started looking at this and it told me that it was not here to teach the meaning of love, I needed to find for myself in the midst of that, my own meaning for love. So, um, uh, da, 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 da. And, and so, you know, I kept looking at it and, and so, yeah, it would be nice if we could just say, you know, something very simple about it. For, but for each of us, I think we're perplexed over this, this thing, this notion of, of, of how love is, how, you know, how do we say that God is love? And then we see these gods of fear and retribution and, and a God that punishes and a God that does this and a God that, you know, so, so, so it became this thing. We, we've imbued fear into the very definition of what many of us has thought of love. And, and not everybody came up in abusive households. Not everybody came up um, with, with dysfunctional families and, and parents that are beating them. And you know what, and, and bless my, my parents' heart. I, you know, we used to, we used to get punished as children. I get these things, you know, they get out the belt and give us whooping. And my mother, bless her heart, was one of those people. And, and I will say, cause I think I turned out pretty doggone good, but my mother was one of those that as she gave you these whoopings, she would have to talk while she was beating your butt. And so she would, you know, say, I'm not whooping you because of this. I'm doing it because I love you. And so, um, so, so hearing that as a child, we get these different notions like, well, can you not love me so much? I mean, <laughs> I mean, really, it becomes this thing of, of, of saying, you know, well, is, if this is how you show me that you care, I, I need you not to care. And so, so we get mixed messages about what love is. And so, I mean, that's no different for any of us. And so it becomes this thing, this, this period of trying to figure out for ourselves how we see love, what love exactly is, and what it feels like. Because when, when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, and you don't love yourself, and this course tells us it's not here to teach the meaning of love because that's beyond what can be taught. We look around us and we try to figure out what love is. 
And so, you know, I don't even know. I, I, you, this is an exercise that I do in class. I do um, this exercise in class that says, um, I don't know why I'm saying this. And then I tell you to complete the sentence. And so we'll go around the room and people will just say, well, I don't know why I'm saying this, or I don't know why I'm thinking this, but they're supposed to share the first thing that comes to mind. So I don't know why I'm talking about love. But when, when, I, when it said to me, it's beyond what can be taught. I started looking for myself into myself, trying to understand what it is that love is. How can I look at it across the board and say, no matter how it shows up, this is what love is. And then I just got this notion that love is just the fact that I am. Is that not just tripped out? So when I take a breath, that's love. <laughs> when my heart beats, that's love. When I see you, that's love. When I when I perceive light, when I perceive air, when I when I think of anything, it's love. You know why I got to that point? Because I thought I got the notion in one of my meditations, it came to me. It said that the divine lends itself to me as me. And as me, this lending itself to me as me gives me the very energy that I need to breathe. The, the very energy and the power that I use to talk, to think, to see, to walk. It means I'm accessing and sourced in an energy that is not not minds, not minds alone. It is like I am tapping into and plugged into a source that just totally loves me enough to lend itself to me as me to be. I mean, and for me, that was so big. I mean, it's like, Wow, you know, I'm, I'm saying that this very thing that I know to be God is looking and perceiving the world through my eyes. I am host to, which means it operates through me, in me, it lives, moves, and has its being. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, the divine givingness of this energy to me, as me, as you. As your thoughts, as your ideas, as your sharing, as me. And to say that there is only one of us here, and the moment I perceive you, the moment I look around and I see another, I'm thinking, wow, that's love. And that connectedness of us together, that's love. And so when it said it's beyond what can be taught, yeah, because these things, even in our meditations, even this thing called revelation is beyond what can be taught, is beyond what can be shared. It's simply something that you come to know. In an instance, it kind of flashes and it dawns on you and then you get it. You get it on a whole nother level. Ooh, and that's so wonderful and so juicy. So, um, so wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait. Let me let me look at the board. Give me a second. Okay, like take this quote for your um, heart. Does that mean that we need to give our neighbors whoopings? No, 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 no. Um, Okay, so you drew a total blank. I know um, the whooping thing from the drill side. To, amen. Especially when you see me. Okay, yes, it'll be one with love. Yeah. So okay, so so it becomes this thing of you know of just recognizing that in all, through all, this energy exists. This energy that is, is, is God, that source, the same source that I'm plugged into that energizes and animates me, it energizes and animates you. And get this, it gives itself to you without restrictions, without, you know, without saying at the end of the day, you owe me $24. It gives itself freely to you as you. So it becomes this thing of, so now 
this, now what? Right? So, so you get this, you get this wonderful divine energy. You get to show up as you, you get your breath, you get your heartbeat, you get that beautiful body that you are in, you get all of that stuff as you. And so now what do you do with that? And so I ask myself that all the time. So now what do I do with it? Is it enough that I'm just thankful? You know, the Course tells me God doesn't need your gratitude, but you need your gratitude. You need to develop your ability to be grateful because your ability to be grateful would mean that I'm not going to squander this. That ability to be grateful means that all of a sudden, I realize that because I am, because I have breath, because I have a heartbeat, because I, I, I have the ability to think and to speak, there is something required of me. There's something required of you. There's something required of each of us. It's given freely to you. But now the developing the ability to be grateful means now that I have this wonderful gift, and trust me, it's a gift. And just because you don't open it, just because you don't recognize it as a gift, doesn't mean that it takes away from your, um, the, the onus that is placed upon your life to, to do something with that gift. It doesn't take it away. And so now what? This, so what? <laughs> now what kind of thing? So you are here now. You are here now. And love brought you here. Love sustains you. Love keeps you. Love supports you. Love is the reason why you're healthy. And when you and and, and tell I'll tell you this. And and I don't like fearful thoughts. I don't like fear thinking and all this stuff. But sometimes we just know certain truths, right? Certain truths we just know. So if, say, for instance, I'm given, and, and I'll use it, let's change it from the $24 I said. Let's, let's change it into something just simple. If I'm a 100-watt light bulb, if I'm a 100-watt light bulb, and I have the ability to shine brightly all my 100 watts, I get a chance to go to sleep and I get a chance to sleep eight hours. But outside of that eight hours, I get that hundred watts. And say, for instance, I might be shining for, for 15 hours at a hundred watts and I want to take a rest and I might turn out the light and give it some rest. Okay, fine. But now if you show up and you're only using 40 watts of your 100 watt capacity at any given time of the day or for most of the day, which is most what most people do. They give about 40 watts of their 100 watt power, the 100 wattage power that they have. They use and share about 40 watts of that. Now, you know what happens. <laughs> You know what happens if your cells, if the very body that you live in is used to or is built to go at 100 watts and you're only using 40 watts of that 100 watts, then somewhere, somewhere there's a bottleneck, right? And if that bottleneck is, you know, is, is kind of like not letting all the energy that is possible for you to use, if it's not all getting through, then what happens? Does it implode? Hmm. I mean, think about that for a minute. What are you operating at? That's what I wonder. So, okay, so... Um, energizes and animates the whole universe. Yes, it does. Free will is only free if it leads to freedom. The bulb will last longer. What if you if you don't use 100 watts, you think it'll last longer? <laughs> ah, there is only light. Yes, there is only light. And for some reason, people try to like stave off or not use all of that light. It's like if it ah, oh, you know what? Here, here's a here's a funny thing. 
So the other the other day I was I have this pear tree. I talked about the pear tree last week. And the pear tree is right next door. And so I wanted to figure out how to get the most from my pears because sometimes those pears are so wonderfully good. And sometimes you can get them and they're not quite that great. And so I started, you know, I the internet here. So I looked up on the internet about the pears that I have them and they're called Bosch, B-O-S-C. Those are the pears that are next, you know, in that, in that yard. And so what I found out about the pears was is that they, they call them cold pears and they said that when you when you want to eat the pears, if you just want to eat them as a fruit, it's best that you put them in the refrigerator at almost 30 degrees or something very cold. You let them sit for a couple of weeks and then you sit them out on the counter. And then as they kind of ripen out on the counter, they become much more juicy. I mean, just just it just takes the flavor through to the through the roof. And I know sometimes I have those pears and it's just really good, you know. And then sometimes it's like, oh, man, that pear was so hard. You can tell it's supposed to be sweet, but it's just not that sweet. And so, um, you know, to some extent, it's like I always wonder about how do we get, how do we squeeze out the best from ourselves? You know, how do we how do we get the full goodness of what what life has to offer? So is it simply about, you know, just throwing any old thing out there? Is it simply showing up? Is it simply saying, you know what, if I'm only if I'm only broadcasting at 40 percent, at 40 watts of the 100 watts, am I, you know, does that mean that on the other end, on the on the long term part of it, that that uh, that that I've sort of like save something or that it'll, you know, that it'll show up on the end. Here, let me tell you this thing. I had a, <laughs> okay, so I tell all my business, right? So here, here we go. So I used to date this guy and his rule was his father or his grandfather told him that if he had sex too much, that um, when he got older, you know, he wouldn't be able to perform. And so he had this rule about how many times a week he could actually have sex. Now, I kept saying to him, well, wonder if you get to the age of 60 or 50 and you find out that that wasn't quite true. Then you wasted a lot of wonderful opportunity on a notion that you had that if you, if, you know, if you, if, if you did it more, if you, if you gave your full <laughs> while you could, you know, if you gave your full stuff while you could, but no, he wanted to wait. He needed to wait because he needed to be able to have it when he was 60. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, the rate you want, you're not even making it to 60. So it becomes this thing of, um, <laughs> you want proof. <laughs> so it becomes this thing of, of, of you know, of, of just, you know, Right here and right now, what does it mean? You know, what does it mean? So, so love is beyond what can be taught. So for me, it is that divine givingness of itself to all of life. It is that divine givingness of itself to me, to you, to everybody. And so I had a reason for that pear example, but for some reason, it just kind of escaped me. I know I had a reason for telling you about the pears because I was like, oh, that's a good analogy. And then I, you know, once I got through all of that stuff telling you about the pears, then I don't know what the heck the analogy was, but I maybe I made the point. Maybe, I don't know. So you, are you always trying to room up and partner up, Doc? <laughs> So, um, <laughs> he's funny. Um, so they told you you'd go blind and that eyesight hadn't got, and your eyesight has gotten progressively worse. Is that because you believe that or is that because it is real? You know, and, and that becomes the thing. You don't really know. I, I, I don't think that people really know. So if he could only have sex twice a week, 
right? If it was only twice a week when he's in his 30s, because he wanted to be able to do that at the same rate when he gets in his 60s. So now he's pacing himself, as he says. If he doesn't make it to 60, then we won't know. And because I'm not with him anymore, I won't know. And so maybe I'll just give him that call when he turns 60 to see if he's still. But you know what? You guys just kind of always just don't even tell you the truth. So, um... <laughs> Yeah, what if he did? Yeah, but heaven forbid that he does, but um, <laughs> y'all are funny. So, um, and Paul, Pete has no, no, he's not weighing in on that. No way. So you guys, whatever. Um, he was living sperm, but so, um, <laughs> so anyway, they are making jokes over here on on that whole thing. But it, it's it's part of this thing of of just up until why why can't we just live up until we die? Why can't we just come fully up until we can't anymore? Why can't we love fully up until you know? And, and, and I mean, love is the only truth there is. And for us to make it seem as though I need to kind of like hold back and and you know and not give you just not give it what is that love is not what you do love is what you are and so simply by sharing yourself you show up to love you are loved simply by showing up but a lot of people aren't showing up a lot of people are putting a mask up in front of their faces they're showing you the mask that is them that that face that they want you to see because they think you're going to judge the other face but really, I mean, I want to see the real face. I want to see the real, the real, the the uncensored, untethered, the 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 I am not worried about what she's going to think about me person. I want to see that. And so I don't know who else wants to see that. So um, so yeah, there's are you guys still laughing about that? Did he have a Christmas account? Are you <laughs> Y'all are still funny uh, laughing about that. So, so I mean, but there are so many people that that have that type of mentality. That's even the same kind of mentality that goes along with this idea of saving. You save and you save and they save and they save and they save, thinking that they're saving for this, you know, this this stuff thing that might never come. I, I was uh, I was listening to somebody who was talking about um, they had gotten an expensive bottle of wine for Christmas one Christmas, and um, and so they were going to save it for a special occasion. I do this from time to time too. <laughs> I, <laughs> they were going to save this bottle of wine for a special occasion, and so at some point, you know, the one person turns around and says to the other person, you know, we. But take that bottle of wine and put it in a wheel somewhere because it doesn't look like we're going to have an occasion that's special enough for us to open up this bottle of wine. People treat their hearts like that. People treat their lives like that. And you know what? I, heaven forbid, I do. Okay, so wait a minute. Let me say. Larry says, did you hear what the 80-year-old man said when his family became so concerned about him falling in love with an 18-year-old bride. Shut your mouth. <laughs> I think we have the study field by the ACMI crew. I think so. I think you do. If she dies, she dies. Okay, so Larry, what did he say? They said it might lead to an early grave. And he said, if she dies, she dies. <laughs> That's cute. You know, uh, yeah, that's cute. It, it, it's funny, though. Um, I think for all of us, it goes in stages. It goes in stages. And so if we can learn how to be fully present in the stage that we're in. So here's here's the other thing. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm always just telling my business and, and trying to be truthful and come fully to the table. So while we're on that subject. Um, so, so for, for an eight, you know, when we're 18, we're more amused, I think, than anything else with sex. 
and sexuality and all that stuff. We're curious about it. We're amused about it. We find out there's a power in it. And so we do it, you know. But it's not like we really enjoy it. I mean, we think we're enjoying it, but we don't really enjoy it until we get into our, you know, like over a certain age. And then we really enjoy it. Then we, as women, simply can't get enough. And so then it's like he dies out. And then a friend of mine whose mother has got dementia and Alzheimer, she was like, I don't know what it is about that dog on Alzheimer's, but she says, my mother's libido is through the roof. She was like, I, I can't even believe that at her age, she's out there chasing down people like she's in heat. And I'm thinking like, oh, shut up. <laughs> and so... It, you know, it's in stages, it's in spurts, and heaven forbid that when I get 85, I'm going to still be going around looking for a fix from somewhere. Heaven forbid that anybody, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I And, and God bless them. I mean, at a certain point that we have to lose all of these ideas about about what ought to be and what should be and just come fully to the moment because if we are as full as we can, if we give that 100 watts in whatever freeze frame moment we're in, if we use that 100 watts, then we're not worried about what we didn't do because when you don't do something is when the imperfections show through. When you when you when you're only at the 40% and knew that you could give 80 or 100%, then that's when you start to have the regrets and the judgments. So if we come fully to the moment, at that moment and just the whole 100 watts then I mean how good and how wonderful must that be and so um and so it becomes this thing when we judge ourselves we're not judging ourselves from 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 our fullness we're judging ourselves that's the ego that's the ego self that's judging. And if we could get beyond that ego self that, that sees all of these flaws and all these wrong things or all this other stuff. <laughs> and so uh, it, it you cut it out. <laughs> so if, if we just come and it's just like, mm, you know, the all force energy then and we're giving all that we've got then we have no regrets but if you're only giving 40 and you have the ability to give more then that's where it is that is the blocks that's the blocks that we're trying to remove remember it says it's here to remove the blocks to your awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. The blocks is the places where you kind of stave off or, or shave off because they shouldn't quite have that much. And so, um, and so, yeah. But there is something, too, about recognizing the autonomy of others and the right of others to make choices for themselves. And so um, two willing folks and two consenting folks, it's in the context of these relationships. It's in the context of these unions that we really get our best growth. I mean, we, you know, the Course says, you know, the, the, that salvation is a collaborative venture. It's in the context of a union, of friendships, of, of us coming together and uniting that we really grow, that we really get to have that sandpaper that smooths out those rough edges and shows us how to love truly. I mean, because if we just sit back in our own little rooms and we talk about it and we don't try to practice it, then we don't even try to do anything. We don't ever have anybody that challenges us. So we can see that, you know, that it's something else. Yeah. So if we don't, if we don't even get to that point, then what have we done? So, so it becomes, you know, it, it becomes this thing of let's embark upon, you know, trying to figure out where it is that we're, we're, we're blocking love out. What is it that we're doing that's blocking love's presence? 
that's what this course says that it's going to do. It's going to remove the blocks to your awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. If you are love, you were created in love, to love, and everything is love. These little fences that you've erected in the middle of yourself trying to keep love out, uh, you know, is, is mm, that's what we're trying to do away with. That's what we're trying to, you know, shoot down and get rid of. And so that's what it is that that we're here trying to do. Okay, so uh, Willie Nelson said that he had outlived his best friend, his old best friend. He had outlived his old best friend. <laughs> okay, I'm going to outlive myself, mm, but just for the heck of it. All right, there you go. Um, and so Willie is a fascinating dude. Yeah, 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 yeah. All of you are fascinating. But you know what? And, and the funny thing is, is that we tend to find people more fascinating who are less concerned about what people think about them. It's as if, um, it's as if uh, the people who are real and authentic and who really just don't care, you know, seem to be a lot more fascinating than those that are busy trying to worry, worried about, I wonder what he's going to think about me if I say this. And I wonder what he's going to think about me if I do this. Blah, 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 blah. That's not very interesting. But no, the other day, um, um, my girlfriend did tell me that she says, you know, guys like crazy Sandra so you need to stop acting so sane because they don't like women that are sane they don't like women that are even killed they like crazy and I you know and I and I was thinking like oh, I, you know I don't know that I'm attracted to people who like crazy I don't do crazy well but you know I don't do crazy well now I do do um yeah, I can, I can, you know, yeah. uh, you know, uh, Woody Allen is a funny guy. Now they're talking about Woody Allen on the, on the chat room. So for those of you who may be watching Ustream, uh, let me, let me say that I do this show in a chat room on Pal Talk. Uh, it's a chat room called ACIM Gather for Course in Miracles. And it's under the education thing if you in case you're going to paltalk.com. But uh, and and so I get to read off of the board. And so I've got all these folks on here that are just going through and talking about any number of things. So Woody Sal Allen said he's not afraid of dying. He just doesn't want to be there when it happens. And so, um, yeah, there you go. He probably won't be. If you open a door naked and they still come in for a cup of tea, keep them. <laughs> well, that just depends, I guess. Uh, have you tried that pee? <laughs> yes, with the help of witnesses. And did anybody come in? I'm wondering. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not going to try that one, Peter. I think I'll pass on that. Somebody probably would come in and close the door. I want to take off their clothes, too. That's not, that don't work with women, you know, because guys are a different breed. You guys are a different breed. Okay, so, um, so let me see. Where am I going from here? Um, <laughs> so let me, let me look down at um, <sighs> okay so you got us cranked up okay well maybe I did that I don't know okay so I looked down at my book and I do have my book open to some place and um, okay and, and so I'll read to you what I've got here and then I'll do because I've got about eight more minutes so it says here, when I look down at my book, I'm in uh, chapter 8. This is where the book was open to when I look down chapter 8. And it is the journey back, which is that chapter. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sure you were. And in this uh, in this particular section, the gift of freedom. Ha ha. Who knew? So I'm going to read this real quick without my glasses. So forgive me if I stumble a little bit. 
And uh, but I'm going to read this because it's here for a reason. Whom you seek to imprison, you do not love. Therefore, when you seek to imprison anyway, anyone, including yourself, you do not love him and you cannot identify him with him. When you imprison yourself, you're losing sight of your true identification with me and with the Father. Your identification with the Father and your identification is with the Father and with the Son. It cannot be one. Hmm. It cannot be one and not with the other. If you are part of the one, you must be a part of the other because they are one. The Holy Trinity is the Holy Trinity is holy because it is one. I need to put on my glasses and I don't see them here. If you exclude yourself from the union, you are perceiving the Holy Trinity is separated. You must be included in it. It because it is everything. Unless you take your part in it and fulfill your function as part of it. The Holy Trinity is bereft as you are. No part can be imprisoned if its truth is to be known. Ooh, I love that. You know, and, and what do we normally think about as a prison? We usually think that prisons have walls, doors, locks, and keys, don't we? I can't find my glasses. Okay, you can't see to find your glasses. Okay, so, so okay, mine, I, I see them now, now that I've moved the computer. Um, but we usually think of, uh, of prisons as things with walls and doors, locks, and keys. And we think that it's something that keeps us stuck in the place where we are. But if you start to realize that you, we create prisons for ourselves through our thinking, through our mind, through our thoughts, um, it's so interesting because most of the prisons that we dwell in, you and I, and most people dwell in, is the prison that they've created through their thoughts and in their mind. You know how we say that something just simply can't be. I know for me, I... I um I'm driving this this truck now and I I know to some extent I think to myself all the time yeah this is my thought I think to myself wow I used to go and I used to go to this place and I used to go to that place and I used to go here and there and then what I realized is is that it's not that I don't have the ability to go those places it's that there's a part of me that's thinking about one the gas Two, the parking. Um, three, I want to say the gas over again, but then it becomes this thing of, okay, so that's all the way over there. Um, and when I get there, am I going to be able to park this doggone thing because of, you know, this, this um, because it's much longer than the cars that I'm used to driving. And so it becomes all of these things, all of these restrictions that I've created in my mind that have no place in reality. And so how often is it that we put ourselves in, in these little prisons, in these little cells, in these confines that tell us what we can't do? I mean, think about it for a second. I mean, for the longest since time began, people have said what they could and could not do, what they were unable to do. They've erected these walls based on their own perception. But if you remain as God created you, God created you whole, perfect, and complete. You are still in this thing called God. And if you know this, that means that you know, I know, that there is nothing that is outside of your ability and your power to do, be, to have. And so the moment we start to recognize that power within ourselves is the moment that we get to bear witness to others that it is the same. You're a miracle worker. You know you're a miracle worker. That's what we do. That's what we do. And so just keep working your miracles. That's what we do. And so I love that thing. I, I don't know how many of you saw my wall today. Um, I think it was today. But it came up on my Facebook wall, this, um, 
this thing I found. And it's just a pretty cute picture. And on the pretty cute picture, it says that um, what we all know here, it didn't come up today, it came up yesterday. It says a miracle is simply a shift in perception from fear to love. A miracle is a shift in perspective. Uh, in perception from fear to love. So wonder if you simply change your perception about yourself, about what's possible, about what love is. And then if you, if you change your perception, it may be that you'll remove all these blocks that tell you that you can't when you really can. Maybe you'll remove all of the the blocks that shows you that you are way more loved, way more special, way more gifted than you can ever imagine. All of those things are here for you because that's what it is. I mean, you're a miracle worker. So, and, and here's the other thing. I, I'll tell you this real quick too. A friend of mine's, and I don't know why I forget this stuff so quick, um, but a friend of mine's was, you know, he was like, Ooh, you must have been drinking last night because you parked your car all wild and all this other stuff. What he didn't know was is that I parked my car the way I did on purpose. It had absolutely nothing to do with being drunk. And then he said, sometimes if we don't ask the questions, we don't get to verify the information that tells us that the way we were thinking was really wrong in the first place. It, it allows us to shift the perception because what we think is true is not always necessarily true. So it's like just be open to the possibilities that what you think may not be so. And then you'll have a shift in your own perception and see how, how quick and easy it is for us to draw the wrong conclusions. It's really only one of us here. We're all here to be mirrors for each other and to love. So remove your blocks to your awareness of love and keep it moving. All right, so um, and there's a no better prison than a self-made prison. Stone walls do not prison, do not a prison make, nor iron bars or a cage. So, uh, hey, hey, not to mention the rules. Yeah, let's get rid of the rules, throw them out the window. Um, I'm tired of thinking about it. Okay, so you guys, um, it's uh, it's time for me to go. And uh, I don't know who's up next, but nothing real can be threatened and nothing unreal exists here in lies the peace of God. It's time for me to go. Thank you so much for being here, for joining me, SandraSetit.com. Follow me on Twitter, at SandBishop, that's at S-A-N-B-I-S-H-O-P. Um, if you're looking for me on Facebook, Sandra D. Bishop, or you can facebook.com forward slash Sandra Thrives. I love you. Hey, Dove. And uh, I'll talk to you guys on uh, what? On Wednesday. All right. See ya. <laughs> All right. So.